<laughs> so this uh, is uh, a presentation that uh, is uh, going to cover a lot of grounds. I, I am going to try to make this as easy as possible, but there's a lot of information that's packed into a very small amount of text. And so I guess the best way is to first uh, introduce you to where we actually are. So um, as usual, I'm going to start this with the uh, virtual Pyramid of Unas. And we're looking north now down the entry corridor, the horizontal passage. There's a couple of things that I wanted to remind you about that uh, there are, there used to be at some point, presumably three portcullis stones here that were blocking this way. And when uh, Gaston Maspero uh, entered the pyramid in 1881, those portcullis stones had already been removed. So he basically walked into a breached pyramid. So, and then um, what I want to, um, suggest is that this passage here with the portcullis stones may be, and then it's just a slight suggestion, and I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this, it may be the equivalent, the equivalent of a soul passage that uh, the basel of the deceased king uh, takes to ascend to the northern sky. And that means the soul would have to go through these portals, through, through these blocked portals, three of them, that is, and they would have to be unblocked in order for the soul to go through. Now, this is different from a car door. A car can move through a false door, but in terms of the bar, this may not be possible until there's magic that allows these gates to be opened. And, um, and so this, in some ways, reminds me of the shafts that come out of the, 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 uh, the king and the queen chamber in the Great Pyramid, where you have, they're, they're really unique, and there are, there are uh, slabs that seal the shafts that come out of the queen chamber, and they had these handle-like uh, metal, uh, bent metal rods, and it sort of reminds you of a portcullis, like a portal. And then, uh, you know, as you probably know, behind the one on the southern side, there was there was another slab. And so it sort of reminds me of a series of portcullises. Um, and the text that we're going to look at right now uh, seems to suggest that this may, in fact, be the passage for the basel to to go to the north, and that it would have to have past uh, such a barrier. Um, so this is something uh, that I'm going to take a look at you with you in just a few moments. So let's uh, turn this around. And um, this, what you're looking at now here on the, the west side of the entry and the east side are in fact the last few pyramid texts of uh, the entire corpus of text. So the pyramid texts end with these symbols right here. So the last, uh, the last three symbols of the pyramid text in the Pyramid of Unas are P, T, and the sky sign. So PET is for sky. Uh, and, uh, and those two walls is what I'm going to focus on today. So this is the east wall. Uh, and it's it's red from uh, south to north, and this is the west wall, which is likewise red from south to north. So the texts uh, come from the the texts uh, come from the antechamber, and they they end up here in this lower corner. Let me take you over here. So this this is the last symbol on the north wall of the antechamber and it happens to be the red crown, right? So this is the last symbol. And then the pyramid text will continue into this wall right here. And it happened so that there was some damage here in the first uh, column. But fortunately, there is a, another copy of the, of the identical texts from the Pyramid of Unas in, uh, in the Middle Kingdom tomb uh, uh, at Licht, and this is um, an official by the name of Imhotep. It's not the same Imhotep that was under Djoser, but uh, someone with the same name. And B 
because of that copy of the same text, uh, Egyptologists have been able to reconstruct this missing text here that was uh, defaced by this damage. Um, but, and this is, uh, this is actually a very important text because it has to do with opening of the door through which the bar will go through. And it opens a glide path, which is mentioned here. It's called the Zebanet. So uh, let me show this to you. I'm just gonna highlight a few things before I go to the full translation, just so you get the overall picture, uh, what is contained on these two walls here. So here's the Zebanet. That's a glide path of Horus. And that glide path is, uh, is open up uh, by pulling away the, the door bolt. And the door bolt is uh, symbolized here by the phallus of Babi. And this is mentioned here in the damage section. So I'm gonna show you that text a little bit later when, I, um, when I'm gonna start translating this for you. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that there's a guardian that is standing at this gate and this guardian is warded off. Uh, this is along the lines of the guarded gates in the middle kingdom when you have the coffin texts and that, that's a big theme there that you have celestial gates uh, that control the flow and traffic in the sky. And these gates are guarded by demons that uh, have to be appeased with magic spells in the coffin text. And this is to a large degree what the coffin texts are all about. It's basically to teach Heka magic to the deceased to be able to make it to these gates. And the, the same exact, the same gate concept is right here. So for example, here you see, you know, words to be spoken. It says hawk means uh, uh, back off, so to speak, um, uh, to, uh, uh, back off neg and neg refers to this bull. So it's a logogram because they have a slash. So it's a horned bull basically is called a neg. And then it says, uh, ga, uh, 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 it says the, uh, the gourd, gourd horn, horned one, jeba with the fingers, uh, of the um on on with the fingers on the of the earth on the horn on the horn this is the upet which means the cattle horn on on his cattle horn so this is uh some kind of spell a ward off spell to basically make the guardian go away so that this door can open up and by the way this door is a sealed door so that's mentioned in that missing text which i'm going to show you in a few moments um the next thing I wanted to show you is a great Heka invocation. Here, for example, we have, um, it's this kind of a, one of those strange texts where you don't really know what it means, but when you look closely, then you realize why it's spelled out like that because there is a Heka invocation embedded. So here it says, Unas Pai, Unas is the one uh, who uh, I, is Ayon, means she's a baboon, okay? And so it says then, Hethet, Patheth, okay. Hethet Patheth is sort of means you know he's jubilating, he's screeching, he's howling, um, uh, and uh, and then but if you look closely, there is an anagrammatic patha hiding in here, right? So if so, it says Heth Hethet Hethet, and then it says pa feth right but this p that t and that h if you read it backwards reads pata and pata is of course the memphi creator god that intellectually creates the universe with his thoughts and with his utterances okay so this is basically the uh the the creation story in ancient egypt that is closest to the logos idea uh, that I've been uh, mentioning in the last few presentations. So there you go. There's Pata hiding right here in this column. And there's more hiding here. So for example, we have, uh, we have a specific mention of uh, the great Mehit, right? So here, for example, we have Mehit 
and it's the flood and there's Ured. So it's the great Mahid and specifically refers to the great flood. Um, and so, yes, so Mahid was the lioness, but it was also a name for the great flood. And it is mentioned right here. Uh, what we also have here, for example, is so there's no doubt that we're talking about Heka. So here's Unas is magic, Heka magic. Uh, and there is a overall direction here that as you pass this gate and you're going north along this wall, this whole description here um, has to do with the Delta. There's really, uh, it's really made obvious that because you're talking about Sobek, you talk about night, uh, the goddess of the north, uh, Wajet, green. So there's pastures, there's marshes. Um, and all of this basically adds up to a direction of flow that goes to the north and goes into the delta. So this is sort of the paradise, if you will, that uh, the spirit of Unas is heading for, the, the soul of the, the Ba soul is heading for. So um, those are some of the themes, uh, themes here. And there is something now that relates to the great flood, Mahit Waret, Waret, that is on the other wall. So I'm gonna to go to this as well. And then I have to give you some background to explain this. So here is also damage on the side, but this also was reconstructed. And this is an extremely important part of the story because what this says here is that Unas is swallowing his seven urea uh, cobra snakes. He's swallowing them and they turn into vertebral bones of neck bones, basically. And that is the, that's the, basically the conversion of a serpent into a mammal, into a, a primate. Okay. That's what this, that's what this is basically saying. And it's, but what does that mean? Well, it turns out, as I will show you, that it has to do with the hood of the cobra that then becomes the, uh, the, the neck folds of the baboon's face, which is also sort of has this sort of flared uh, appearance. And so it's, bas it's basically a neck, uh, one flare, uh, uh, flared neck turning into another one, but it's now based on a mammal. And of course, Unas is being shown here as a baboon. This entire, all these two walls is basically about him uh, not really being Horus, uh, uh, but being um, being a baboon. There is mention of mirror here. Uh, it's called uh, uh, it's called on. Uh, so he he is uh, he has mirror in on his fingers. There is um, there's he's controlling the Aeneid, the nine. Uh, there are, he's the uniter of the land, of the two lands, um, of the north and the south. Um, and then finally, we have in the, in this last pyramid text here, this idea that he's now the full moon and he's chasing away all the stars in the sky. And he is basically the Lord of the skies. And, uh, and most importantly, it mentions specifically that he does not know his mother. And this is one of the epithets of course, of Thoth, the moon, that uh, he does not know his mother. Um, so all of this is very nicely connecting up with the gable in the, in the antechamber, the east gable, because there we had the new moon. We came from the south wall. We had, uh, we had the waning moon. Then we had the new moon on the east wall uh, at the gable. That is, which was, was, which was Aimun, Khonzu was mentioned if you remember, and then we have the north wall, which I haven't discussed yet, but I'm going to skip over that just to focus on these last few walls here that uh, is the tail end of the pyramid text. And so here now we have the full moon uh, and the full moon is represented by Bobby, B-A-B-Y. Okay, so um, now I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to leave this open because I'm probably going to, I'm going to refer to this back again, but I'm now going to show you something that has to do with uh, the, the rendition of these mythological creation stories in much later times. So this is now Ptolemaic hieroglyphic. We talk about the Edfu Temple. The Edfu Temple is, is a megalithic book. If you go into the Edfu Temple, uh, the creation story, the Memphite creation story, which is Ptah based, 
is written in the frieze all the way at, on the top of the inner Western girdle wall. And the characters that appear in this creation story is what I want to focus on. And so this is now uh, a publication by uh, the, uh, the Edfu project and uh, the chief translator is Dieter Kort. Uh, he's, he's an expert in Ptolemaic hieroglyphic, which is a difficult version of hieroglyphic because there's a lot more symbols than in old hieroglyphic. The, the language that I'm showing to you in the pyramid text is pretty much uh, gets gets uh, uh, most of its repertoire from about 700 symbols, which is a lot, but uh, it's not nearly what uh, Ptolemaic writing is using, which is over 7,000 symbols. So, um, so Dieter Court is an expert on Ptolemaic hieroglyphic, and him and his team have been working for years to translate the Edfu text. So this is uh, written in German and it's not so important right now, but I just want to introduce you to the characters because that is really uh, the main thing of importance here. So the characters uh, comprise a group of 30, okay? And they're grouped here. So you understand conceptually uh, what these characters, what their roles are. So in the center, we have Thoth and Seshat, so Thoth, the god of writing, among many other things, the moon god, Seshat is the, the goddess of astronomy and archiving. And Thoth is, is uh, facing uh, Horachti. So this is the, this is the, the royal sun, sun god, uh, the falcon god. And then facing Seshat is Ptah. So Ptah is the creator god in the Memphite uh, cosmogony. Um, and when, when Ptah conceives an idea, then those facilities, the, the far away idea, the distant idea, and then the idea brought into the, into the forefront of attention, those two concepts are personified with the Sheptiu. So the Sheptiu are over here. So we have the uh, Uai and the Oa. So the Uai is the far one and the Oa is the great one. So the far one is the distant thought, uh, the vague idea, and the Oa is the great idea that's in the forefront of your attention. And so that is the first, that's the conceptual process, that's the willing, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, that's the part of creation where the creator wills something that he wants to create or she. And so uh, it's he in this case. So Pata is a male deity. But uh, this, uh, so these are the, these are the uh, conceiving facilities of uh, Logos in the, in the Egyptian version of it, which is the Memphite cosmogony. And then you have the utterance, which is the executive function. So when you utter these thoughts, then you, you create. And that creation, those, those uh, utterances are the so-called Jaisu. So these are seven uh, spirits, uh, personified creation words. They're called Jaisu. Uh, and these are the creation words that end up getting stored in the creation library, the, the, if you will, the archive of the Genesis archive in ancient Egypt by Seshat. Okay, so this is how this all connects. So the Sheptiu are the, the thoughts conceived, Pata inside of the mind of Tha, and then he utter, utters these concepts into creation by creating the Jaisu, the seven Jaisu that are then stored and archived. They're recorded by Thoth, who's standing right here, into words that will then be archived by Seshat. Okay. And then these words, these concepts uh, that have been uttered, created by Pata, will then be built into material substance by the, uh, the Khenemu. And so as you can see, this is the Ram God. So Kanum is the potter. Uh, it's the, the uh, guardian of the Nile. And, um, but in this, particular, in this particular sequence, these are the Khanum gods are basically the, the potters. These are the ones that take the Jaisu uh, blueprint, if you will, and turn it into substance, okay? So you have seven of the Jaisu and you have seven of the Kenemu. 
Uh, and to complete the picture, we're missing still uh, 10 more to make 30. And so these are, these eight ones here are the Ogdoad. So these are the primordial uh, gods from the Hermopolitan, Hermopolitan cosmogony, where you have uh, four couples of snakes and frogs that constitute the original cosmic chaos out of which, into which creation occurs. So, and those are invisibility, darkness, the cosmic sea. And, um, and uh, I think, uh, what was the other one? Uh, so darkness uh, and, uh, oh, and but the cosmic sea, darkness, invisibility, and I'm missing one, but I'll remember in a moment. So there's basically four primordial concepts of chaos and into that chaos creation occurs. So uh, and then we, the final two are these guardians here. So they are basically the, the Lord of the 30 is the Neb uh, Moba. Moba means 30. This is the Lord. Uh, and then uh, this is the Oa Senet. So these two are guardians basically uh, that protect the other 28. So um, now I want to show you how these, this concept is really not something that was originally from the Ptolemaic era because all of this, almost all of this really dates back, originates at its root from the pyramid text. And one way, one way to prove this to you is uh, to remind you that the substance from which these Jaisu arise, these, these creation words are really, it's because it's a watery substance. It's the, it is the, uh, the great flood. It's the uh, Mehit Uret. So in, out of the great flood waters come the creation words that were uttered by Ptah and the Sheptiu are uh, the ones that in this Etvu creation, the ones that initially feud before, you know, before all of this happens, the Sheptiu are actually feuding tight to Titan, so to speak. They're land and water. They're fighting for supremacy. And what ends up happening is they, you have the first mount of creation, you have the water, the land coming out of the water. So the water is receding and the Sheptiu's make peace. And they then start collaborating with the creator uh, to allow creation to happen. And the other thing that they do is that they tie together reeds in order to make the Jeba, which is the original perch onto which Horus lands. And then that perch becomes the throne of royalty, the divine, uh, it's the divine representation on earth, which becomes the royal uh, house, okay, and that is basically the Edfu temple. So this is what I gave you in a nutshell right now is the is basically the Edfu mythology, the Memphite cosmogony, and so that way I've now introduced you to all these characters that uh, you will see in various positions in the Edfu temple. So now what I want to do is to take you back to the Unas pyramid to uh, to point out some of these uh, characters, okay? And so let's go back to the pyramid. So if you remember, uh, I was to orient myself. So here is, it says here to give you the context. So um, it says, Ein means Unas has, uh, Unas has come, uh, uh, with respect are with respect to uh, mer, uh, Meruf means his canals, okay? Uh, Aimu, I, Aidebu means banks. Uh, the, uh, I, okay, it says Aidebutiu I, I are the river bankers, are, are the entities that live by the ring. This usually refers to crocodiles, actually. So, the river bankers are usually crocodiles. So he has come to his canals uh, and uh, to the river bankers. And it says now, uh, it says Ageb, Ageb Mu, it's the great uh, Ageb Mu M Mehet, Mehet Waret. So he's, wait, he's basically there is waiting for the, uh, for the, for the immersion 
the, the flooding of the great flood. That's what this basically means. So, so here we have clear, we have, we, we have Una's passed through this gate. He's now in the Delta, so to speak. And now uh, he's here waiting for the flood to happen. And so that is, that, that is the, uh, the context, the creation context, uh, the chaos in, in the beginning. And now I'm going to show you the, how the creation words, and we are, and I forgot to mention, of course, Pata is Heka invocated over, where was it? Here, right? It was up here. So there's P, there's T, there's A. So we have Pata and we have the great flood, Mehi Dwaret, okay? And now, um, and of course, Babi, which is the, the baboon, the, the bull of the baboons is, uh, is mentioned over here. So we have Thoth in attendance as well. Uh, and, and now what I'm gonna show you are these, where the seven creation words come in, okay, into play. And so that has to do, well, you can see it. The number seven is written right here and it's over here and it's over here. What this text says is basically that Unas, is swallowing the seven cobra snake urei. Ureus is basically the cobra that's attached to the head. That's a, it's a power symbol. It's a solar power symbol. And he has swallowed them and he has replaced them with seven vertebra. Okay. And and of course he is a he's not a serpent any longer. He is now um, he's now uh, a baboon. Okay. And these, these seven vertebra that have grown now into a spine are basically these seven spirits, okay? So let me, let me show you why, because they are actually baboons, okay? So the Jaisu, here, the, here are the seven Jaisu and here are the two Sheptiu. Uh, and, and here, by the way, this, uh, yeah, this looks like Thoth right here. So the, the, these creation words are basically, they have reeds in their hands. And that's because when Pata utters them, then they come into existence. They come out of the great flood and then they are recorded by Thoth as these words. So these, what you're looking at are the seven creation words. Okay. And, um, to show you how this is spelled out, let me see if I have a spelling for that. I think I did. Um, let me see if I still have it. Yeah, I think it's over. It might be, or it might be over here. Yeah, here. So here is how you spell the word Jai Su. So there's Ja. And by the way, Ja is also the word stem for fairy, uh, if you remember. So the fairy, of course, relates to the moon. So does the baboon. And, <coughs> excuse me. And there is the baboon sitting right here. So the ja is, the jaisu is plural, right? The jais is uh, singular. So jaisu are these creation words and that's how you spell it. And there is a baboon sitting right here. Okay. And, so what I am suggesting to you is that the seven creator spirits are encoded. The root of the origin of this is really the, verte the vertebral spine of the baboon that is now incorporated into Unas's uh, manifestation as a baboon, as a hacker master, as Thoth, the moon. Um, if you remember from the Eastern Gable that the bones of the gods were important to give Unas that extra power that the gods have over the mortals, right? The bones were heated, the resu were heated to make a meal for Unas. And it's that, it's that, uh, that heat, those heated bones, the essence of those bones that imbues the, the, the meal is what gives Unas that extra strength. So the bones is, According, apparently to the ancient Egyptians, the bones carried 
this power, okay, of experience, of, of hacker magic, of extra knowledge. And so that's how you can explain this. And now I wanted to show you just so you, uh, just to remind you that baboons, just like humans have seven cervical bones, um, but a cobra snake has a lot of bones. So, so I have a few photos to show you. Um, let me see the best way to pull these up. So yeah, here. So this is, uh, wait, let me first show you the cobra snake. So here's an Egyptian cobra. And of course, this is the famous hooding effect, right? So they spread out their, their uh, vertebral, their cervical, uh, their cervical bones. They flare them out so that the hood opens up like that, okay? And the bone structure that makes that happen is uh, shown here. So these are the, these are the ribs, so to speak, attached to the cervical, the cervical spine, the cervical portion of the spine of the cobra. And these ribs, they are attached to muscles. And when those muscles contract, then these ribs flare up and you get this hooding effect, okay? Um, and now let me show you something that will probably maybe amaze you, but what I'm suggesting to you is that the nemes tail of the Great Sphinx is really the same idea. So this is the flare of a cobra, okay? That's what this is supposed to symbolize in the solar version of, of this monument. So this is a solar monument dedicated to Atum, the ureus on the forehead, of course, is broken off, but there used to be a ureus attached to the forehead. And then this is symbolizing the hood of the cobra and the nemes tail behind the sphinx, which you can't see in this photo, that is the tail of the cobra. So I think the statue is representing the serpent, serpentine version of this, uh, this uh, uh, how should I say, divine image, okay? So this is the solar image and it, uh, it has the cobra anatomical features. But what we're talking about in inside of the pyramid of Unas now, we have this uh, focus on, on the baboon, right? So, and that's of course the moon. So this is a lunar uh, emphasis, not a solar emphasis. And I think this is really one of the big take homes from the pyramid text that has not been appreciated that we're having a sort of a conspiracy by the office here to, to push for, to keep alive a cult that may have been usurped by the solar cult, right? So with the Linus Mahit and the moon, uh, that was a much older, much more archaic cult. And it had to give way to a solar cult that, that was tied to the Sphinx. And so that meant that the Linus became a Sphinx and uh, the worship of the moon turned into worship of the sun. And what these pyramid texts are doing are basically reversing that. They're saying, no, look, the origin of all of this is, is the moon and, uh, and the lioness, okay? And so that's why Mahit is mentioned. And that's why, um, that's why this conversion from, uh, from the, the Uraeus, swallowing the Uraeus and then turning that into the backbones, okay? And at the word for backbones is Nehebut. Uh, and I think you can see, the, here's the, okay, here you can see the word IR root. That's the, those are the seven uh, ureas. And, and you can't see this word written here, but he's swallowing them. And then what happens is, uh, sefechet, by the way, sefechet means seven. And then here it says nehebut. It's partially hidden, but nehebut means cervical bones. Okay, so that is what those urea I swallowed here I turn into. They become cervical bones. And then, and then Unas is now a baboon, okay? Um, so so this, is, uh, this is one way that you could identify the root origin of these creation words. Uh, and that is basically in the spine of these, um, in the spine of this, con this transfigured uh, spirit that is ascent that is about to ascend into the sky. So that's where its power is basically in the spine bones, in the cervical spine bones. And and of course, what is that power? What is the power to create? And when you by creating it, you are uh, you're giving it substance. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so I think uh, that's maybe a good warm up. Um, I uh, wanted to show you. Yeah, so we can what we can do now is uh, I'm going to show you the the first column on this. Um, I am going to show you the first column. Yeah, we can actually close this image. We don't need this anymore. We don't need this. Um, so in if on this um, this western wall, remember this column is obscured because of damage. So what I'm going to show you now is another version of the Unas pyramid pyramid text that was used verbatim in a tomb in Licht, and this is by uh, by an official called Imhotep. And that's how we can reconstruct this text. And so I pulled this out because I want you to see the actual text, so you you see the significance of it. Um, so that text is um, over here. So what you're looking at is basically the text that would that that would have been in that first column, right? So it says um, Jetmedu, and then it says it says Se uh, Sta S. That's S, and this is Sta. Uh, Rostau, for example, is written with three of these ropes going through this line. So this is the then it's the stau, the plural. But if you have one, it's the um, it's it's a singular. So this is pronounced sesta, ses, sesta, and that means pull pull back. Okay, and then here it's henen and henen, and then here it says b ba b. E, e or I, yeah, Babi. So this is this is the full moon. This is Toth. This is the full moon. It says basically pull back. Henen means means phallus. Um, it, it means phallus literally, but what is meant is actually the door bolt that's keeping this door closed. And the confirmation of that comes in the next column. It says uh, it says Ayun, which means open the two door leaves, okay, of the skies, and they're sealed. This is Chetem. So we know now that this door, that there are, that there are two doors that are basically blocking this way out the, out the northern path, and it's a sealed door. So this is why I mentioned to you is that this reminds me of the sealed shafts that come out of the queen chamber that have these two handles on the slab. If that is a miniaturized portal, of course, you know, like a, basically it's sort of like a like a symbolic door through which uh, the Ba has to escape by saying a magic spell and warding off the, the guardian and then the door opens up and the Ba can escape. OK, so something to keep in mind um, and consider maybe. So anyway, so this this is what this says. And then. And then it says it continues with the door for una for this unas, uh, what a way so open basically an a way for this unas and so there's a confirmation again that it's unas really who wants to get out of this wants to go to the north okay and it's his ba that wants to do that uh, then then so then the next the text continues with uh, symbols that we can see and so I'm going to close this now so I can show you what that looks like. Uh, in the Unas pyramid, so we can we can close this image now because I've reconstructed this. Uh, and now for that, I'm going to go back to. Uh, I am going to go back to um, the uh, the images from the Alexander Pionkov survey of the of the pyramid of Unas. So these images were all taken by Elif Hassan. And uh, the artistic supervision was by Natasha Rambova, a Hollywood set designer and actress. And she was a friend, she was friends with Alexander Pionkov and they surveyed the Unas pyramid together. So these beautiful images are from, from uh, Rambova and Hassan. So now, so let me take you to the translation. It's a difficult translation. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this fluently, but I'll try to to be as good as I can and also not spend too much time doing it. So I can get you through this as quick as I can. But uh, so what this now says is um, this, uh, remember we're reading now from left to right. So the symbols are facing, uh, they're facing us towards the South. So uh, it says, Harry 
Bejehu, uh, and there's the fire sign. So on be, uh, the Bejehu means a blast, okay? It's a basically an, ex an explosive blast. There are some of you that might uh, find that interesting um, that have you know different theories about what the, the Great Pyramid, the chambers uh, were meant to do. And so this could be an interesting word for some of you. So there's a blast word mentioned here. And then it says Sherry Iconet Neteru. Uh, so Iconet is a, is basically a scooping water. So uh, uh, so it's basically a blast uh, towards the the uh, the cooling the uh, the scooping of cool, of water by the gods. And then it says the Zebenet Herus. That's the gliding path for Horus. Okay. And then uh, it says Zep2, which means to say it twice. Okay, so this is a formulaic uh, text. And then here it says, um, it's Unas, um, so now it says Unas in, on the blast, the same word again, uh, uh, this, this blast. So Unas is on this blast, Sherry, I can add, and under the cooling water, of, um, under the scooping, scoop waters, of the gods, okay? So the scoop, the waters, the cool waters that the gods are scooping, it's usually refers to the sky medium. So up in the sky, the, the ancient Egyptians thought that this is, a, this is uh, up there, it's the cosmic sea and it's separated from earth through by the air. So that's, uh, that's, where, this, that's where this comes from. The Iconet is the, the water scooping gods and that's where he's blasting off to. And then it says, um, uh, it says what uh, it says make so I I I I res, I rise and means to make there make a path for unas and unas okay say say what so that unas may pass uh, I mess means on it okay then it says unas uh, unas I think this is pi m uh, unas, uh, oh no, it says pi, Unas Pi Horus. So Unas is Horus. So this confirms that he is now, this is from a leftover from the North Wall where we have the Ba development. The Ba has erected, it then travels across the North Wall because it wants to go to the North, uh, unlike the Ka, which we, if you remember, ascending off to the East, right? So this is the Ba, and this confirms that Horus now is, uh, is in going out the North as birds usually fly to the north and they come back. So, um, so then we continue. I've already mentioned this. So this says jet, jet medu, words to be spoken. Hak uh, means back you, back off you, uh, uh, horned bull with the gore, nega. Then as jeba means fingers. Um, aker, here's a mention of aker, for example. Alan is translating this as horizon, but you could, is there a possibility that we're talking about the actual double line? It is possible. We have to see if that matches the rest of the context. So we keep it in mind, maybe on the side for now. So the fingers of the horizon or the fingers of our care, uh, and there is the ta, the earth sign, right? So that confirms that our care is the, it's an earth uh, entity. M uh, upetef, so that means his horn. So the, the, the fingers of the, of the of the earth horizon or aker are m on the horns of this this um, this uh, bull that's guarding this gate, right? Um, and then it says I I hear zeven. I hear means um, fall down, and zeven means uh, glide away. So this is a, basically a warding off spell. And then it says unas pai. Uh, Ion, he's a baboon. Okay, so this is now, uh, now we go from falcon, horse, to baboon. So he has now converted into the baboon. And then it says, ne, uh, it says Ion, it says Heth, uh, Heth, that, Pa, that. And this is, this is the, the cheering, the screeching baboon. But remember, this is a Heka. Uh, invocation of Pata reading backwards, so P-T-H. And then it says, um, or, or means his, uh, it actually refers to the, 
he's behind, okay, he's after. So the, the behind of Unas uh, is Harry above his back, Sa, uh, Sa, yeah, that means his back. Uh, then it says, uh, uh, it's on the back of Unas rather. And then it says, I mach, that's the, the, the ridge of the spine. Okay, that's the I mach and there's the sign. It's also in, in uh, abstractly, it's the honor robot. So honor and spine, uh, you know, having a spine means you're honorable, you have a, um, you have discipline, you have a code. And so the ancient Egyptians had the, exactly the same association. So an Aymach is an honorable man, and it also refers to the ridge of the spine. So the, uh, the ridge of the spine of Unas is above his head. Uh, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, is there something hiding in here? Not sure yet. So this is something I'm still working on. There's a lot of complicated passages here. So I'm just going to go through it and then we pick up whatever we can. Uh, then it says Unas. Uh, uh, yeah, it's above Unas's head. And then say, uh, does Unas, Unas does, uh, Henai, uh, and then Hentet, uh, and then Hemsef, he sits, uh, uh, with the young ones. This is what this is saying, yeah. So now the main Heka potentially here is that Hen and Hen Tet may refer in fact to the archive, okay? It's because the Aftet is the original primordial archive where the creation words are stored. So this is the portable chest, the Ark, if you will. Another word for Aftet is Hen. So is it possible now that we have a mention here, a cryptic mention of this original archive? And I think it's possible because it's mentioned twice. Um, and so he's sitting next to this archive, potentially to open it up and to learn the magic that's inside. That is possible. You could, you could look at it that way, but we need a confirmation. So keep on, uh, let's keep going. And so now uh, we have here, I means O, uh, Hem, it says hem, hemesi, o hemesi. Uh, so this is basically what this means is uh, it's referring to a sehet is a star, sehet with the star sign. So this is a particular kind of star and it's called the, uh, hem, the hemesi star. And what kind of star is that? That is a star that is, I think this means, so Alan, I think we translated this, the, the star that's turning its back to Unas. Um, it's Hemes sort of reminds me of sitting. So it's some, somehow it's a sitting star perhaps, but I'm not sure exactly what kind of star this is. But anyways, it says, Nai, Redai, and then. So do not give, you all do not give to Unas, uh, do, 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 uh, what do we say? Do not uh, nai redai n. Uh, they have not given to them for almost his magic. Hemes, uh, he's sitting, Unas is sitting uh, with his back uh, against uh, the, uh, this, the sacred space of of Ayunu, Heliopolis. Okay, so it basically means that he's addressing a star that is threatening to take away his magic, but he's not allowing this to happen because he's sitting with his back to a sacred space that is related to Heliopolis. This is how you, that's how, that's the idea of this sentence, but I can't tell you what exactly is hiding in here in terms of the description of the star. There's probably something hiding, but I can't put my finger on it right now. It's okay. Uh, and then it says, uh, this is Shedu, Unas take, so this is take, this means to take away Unas with respect to the sky. So it's saying, it's basically addressing the star saying, take me, take Unas away to the sky. Don't take away his magic. He's sitting with his back to a sacred space that is related to Heliopolis. So that means, uh, if you remember, we're no longer in Saqqara potentially. We may be in Giza now, on the other side of the um, of the uh, the other side of the Nile, where Heliopolis is. Um, 
So let's go, keep going. Ein Unas, so has, Unas has come uh, ahead of, or in front of, or in advance of, Am uh, and here's Mehit, right? So Mehit has the flood, Ure, uh, Ag, Ag, is this a, Ag, yeah, Agebi. So this is the great immersion, the great flood, uh, the Mehit Uret, right? So here she's mentioned uh, for the first time, and then here later for the second time. Um, so he's basically there waiting for the flood to happen, okay, with his back to the sacred space. And of course, I think this could be Giza, right? So he's sitting maybe next to the Sphinx temple where the docks are, and he's waiting for the flood to come. Uh, and so, and by the way, some of you may not know this, but there were two emplacements above the entrances to the valley temple next door, where you had giant statues of baboon. Uh, of baboons once sitting, staring out to the east. And these were found, one of those statues was found by Uvo Hölscher when he excavated the frontal portion of the Valley Temple. So there is a there is an archae architectural or an archeological uh, corroborate for what I'm saying to you is that these temples were guarded by baboons and these were huge baboons. They were basically bubbies. And, um, and that's what that, and they were sitting with their back to a sacred space, which is the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple. Uh, in the Valley Temple is where the baboons were found. And so um, I'm just bringing up all these pieces of evidence to tell you that in the Pyramid of Unas, we have a simulation of another space with the text, and that could be Giza. And of course, the mention of Zokar, which I mentioned in the last presentation, is yet another piece of evidence for that. So. Um, so this is this could well be where we are with this text. So I and then so no, let's keep going. Um, it says where where do we leave it off here? Uh, yeah, Mehit um, and then it says the great immersion. So the Agebi is another way to say flood. It's an immersion basically of a lot of water. So Unas Unas Pai Unas is the one uh, Se uh, Sobek. So he's now the crocodilian. God. So now we're talking about the Delta, right? Because um, that's where crocodiles hang out. So Sobek, uh, Wajet, uh, uh, shoot. So Wajet is green. Shoot means uh, uh, means dappled. So this is basically the, the scaly green skin of the crocodile. So that's what this refers to. Um, and then it says uh, res, uh, resai means awake, he's with an awake head, so he's alert, his head is up. Crocodiles are river bankers, they wait for prey, so they have their head up, you know, monitoring. So that's what this, this description is. And then it says uh, there, there's hut um, with basically elevated uh, front, okay? So they're in an alert attack position. This crocodile and Sobek is the, of course, a power symbol. So now Unas has turned into Sobek. So we had Horus, then we had a Baboon, and now we have Sobek. Uh, then it says Abesh. Um, Ab Abesh uh, means Abesh um, means apparently splattering around, according to Alan. Abesh uh, per m sebek. And then it says set. So he's coming out. Uh, so he's splattering in some kind of pool. Okay. And of course, that's a, we're talking about Sobek, right? So Sobek is in some kind of water. He's a river banker. So he's splashing around. He's coming out. Uh, and it says Sebek. Uh, and there's a nice word, uh, phonetic mimicry, Sobek, the name. And then Sebek is basically the thigh. Sebek means the thigh, and Chebezet means the tail. So the thigh, the thigh and the tail of the great one. Okay, and of course the great one is Mehit, Uret, and that is the lioness. Okay, so and it makes perfect sense because the the back, the back thigh, the back legs and the tail of the lioness is a sign of Hekai. Okay, so he's basically saying that Unas is it's it's Sobek. And he's coming out now in the form of this crocodile out of the um, the thigh and the tail of the great one, which is the great the lioness. Okay, so he's so what what does this mean? Well, could this mean that the the sphinx stitch is full of water, and and Unas in the form of Sobek 
is splashing around in this ditch, right? And he's basically emerging from the space between uh, the back and the front of the lioness, the major fissure, for example, okay? So is it possible that we're referring to an actual underground canal system that's under the Sphinx, and this is a physical space that's being described here? I'm just bringing it up uh, because there's other clues that are telling us that this is what's going on. For example, the cavern on the east wall that I mentioned before, that cavern has a physical correlate uh, in front of the left forepaw of the Sphinx, which Dobecki and Schock measured, it's anomaly A. Um, it still needs to be probed appropriately to confirm that it's a cavern, but uh, I'm just trying to tell you how the text is, is, seems to be taking us to Giza and it seems to describe uh, places there. For example, also on the gable, we read about the three enclosures, the three falcons, the harams, right? All of these things were, I mentioned in the last video. So this is yet another potential clue here that we're talking about, you know, with this thigh and the tail that we're really talking about a lioness. And of course, the, the name of the lioness Mahit is mentioned twice even, and then it's coming, it's coming up again in just a moment. So Okay, and so then we have, uh, so this is Sobek now coming, uh, emerging per Peru M, the thigh and the tail of the great one. And then it says, I'm T, uh, I, I'm Ahun. So there, there is the great one described as the one in gleaming in the sunlight. Okay, so this is the, um, uh, the I, Ayahu, yeah, the Ayahu is basically the glittering, the gleaming sunlight. So that again is supporting the evidence, it's supporting evidence that we're talking about a statue, the lioness that is gleaming in the sun. And uh, so it's a sun, it's a solar, it's a solar entity, the great one. And of course her name is Mehit Waret. So, you know, all of this is pointing to as in a cryptic way to the statue that was there before the great Sphinx. Of course, this is Unas, the Great Sphinx was already in existence at this point, but the theory here is that this is uh, a reminder that there was something before the Great Sphinx, and this is basically a way to keep it alive without getting yourself killed by mentioning it, because it may have been against official royal decree. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, it says, I set Hetep, uh, Hetep who, uh, wa, wa jet Sechet, uh, uh, okay, so he's, um, did I skip something here? Yeah, yeah, I did skip something. Yeah, so let me find it. So Unas has come, we already covered this, but Unas has come uh, with respect to his canals, okay? And Aimu, Aide Butiu, so these are the river bankers, back to Sobek, right? Ageb, uh, and then it says, Argebus is the emergent M. Moret Moret. So he's basically coming into his canals. He's coming to the riverbanks, waiting, awaiting the, the great flood to happen. Okay. So, and this, this, again, this could well be the banks, the canals that fed the Giza Plateau um, and uh, agricultural lands that were around that plateau. So then it says, um, his play, the place I said uh, Hetepu is, is in peace. Uh, it's a peaceful place, basically. And then it says Wajet, uh, the green marshes. Um, and then it says, I'm uh, in, in the Achet, in the horizon. Then uh, this Saj means, I think this means to cultivate Saj Una. So Una is cultivate Sem, yeah, green grass, for example. Uh, and Harry above, I Tabu. So he's basically cultivating the riverbanks. The um, it kind of reminds me of what's going on in Cairo right now. So apparently, Assisi is cleaning up the city and they're removing all the trash that was next to the canals, and they are now growing uh, plants. Uh, they've covered up the you know the, all the debris. They put netting, and now they are planting things. So this is kind of what this reminds me of. So he's basically cultivating greenery along the riverbanks of the of the Achet of the horizon. Then it says, um, "I I net which he uh, Unas brings." Uh, then it says, "Thehent." That's Fiance. Thehent is Fiance. Okay, he's he's bringing Fiance. Uh, it says, "I read Uret." So this is the great eye. Uh, in hairy eye means in the middle uh, of 
in a hairy eye bed, uh, 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 yeah, it's so it's he's basically bringing fiance for the great eye in the middle of his marshes. That's what this means. Um, then the next, the next, uh, the next line is shes, shezep means he receives shezep. Um, interestingly, shezep is uh, potentially a heka invocation of shezepu, which is statue. Okay, so shezepu is actually refers to the Sphinx statue. Um, it's used as a verb here, but I'm just bringing up. It's it could be a double stitch that we're talking mahit or a triple stitch in this case, that we're really talking about the statue. So here's Mehit first mentioned, the great Mehit. There's another one. And then here's Shesep, which is the, which says Uras receives, but uh, it's also a word to refer to statue. So he receives Iset, which is the throne, uh, his throne, IMT in the Achet. So he's basically now receiving his, his, uh, his horizon throne Ha Unas, he appears, Unas appears, M, uh, so, Sobek, uh, Za, Net. So Night is the, is the archer goddess, very, very ancient goddess, ancient, present from, as, from the first dynasty. And her sanctuary was in the delta of Egypt. So we know we're in the delta now. And of course, we're heading for the northern, we're in the northern corridor. And so this all fits together. So it's said, you know, a nice way to show how topography of the text is, um, is uh, matching what is actually saying. So Onas is appearing in as Sobek, the son of night. He, un, unem, means he eats. Unas eats uh, uh, em, eref, he eats with his mouth, okay. And then it says, uz, it says, uzesh. Uzesh means to pee. Uh, unas pees, uh, and wait a minute, does it say Unas P? Where does it P? And then it says uh, uh, Unas, uh, he eats M it with his mouth. He says he, Unas P's. Uh, and then it says Enek. And so I'm sure you, your, uh, <laughs> your imagination can figure out what this word means. It's, uh, it's pretty graphic. I don't have to repeat it, but it's pretty obvious what it's meant here. Yes. That's part of uh, that's part of uh, life. So Unas is doing that as well. Uh, then he is M uh, M and then and uh, M and then F. Yeah. So this is his phallus. Okay. And then he says Unas is the one who who's uh, pi. And then it says metut met. Yeah, metut is semen. Okay. I and then he I the I, I means to take away, take the the women from the aha sen, which is their their husbands basically. So he's basically taking the women of the husbands uh, with respect to a place merer that Unas likes. And uh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. If what you're thinking is correct, so he's the he's the king. He's the He's the Sobek. So it's a crocodile. Remember, it's a it's a raptor. It's a it's a it's a prowler. It's a it's it's a power symbol in ancient Egypt. And it, it turns out that uh, the crocodiles were eating the women. Like for example, the women were going to the river to let's say wash the clothes or do anything, and then the crocodiles would come and kill the women. Um, and this is even mentioned in. In the Middle Kingdom, there's a famous, uh, famous uh, lit piece of literature called "A Debate of a Man and His Soul," and in that, in that debate, this comes up that a man loses his wife to a river banker, which is a crocodile. So, as you can see, this is a theme that's even coming up here. So, it may be less sexual in nature, even though you see this here mentioned, but it could just be, you know, there's a crocodile that's basically uh, feeding on people that are using the river to do their daily living, okay? So, um, and and yeah, it says Unas basically, it says uh, Chetef, uh, uh, it says where he chooses, where his heart chooses. Yeah, he basically takes takes these women away from their men and he takes them wherever he wants to. So that's, that's what this means. Okay, so this was the, this is the, 
the western half of this entry. So now let's go to the to the to the eastern half, and we've already covered some of this, uh, but just to reiterate, so this has to do with uh, eating the IR root, okay, uh, which are the uh, the urea snakes, and and then they basically reper. Uh, it says here reperen. Uh, Sefet, they, they appear as seven nehebut, uh, so cervicals. Okay, so it's a, it's a it's a transfiguration basically from now, and this is this is why I'm so fascinated by this. It's it seems to be it seems like a conspiracy basically, like the whole thing. Everybody everybody is talking about the pyramid text as a as a sun, as a solar uh, pathway back to the sky, and then all of a sudden here we switch from from uh, we switch from a solar symbol to a moon symbol okay um it's a fascinating um turn of events if you will so then what happens so let me continue so here all these flags this is basically the pool for the Aeneads. so this means the Aeneads, and we have you know one two three four five six seven eight nine twenty seven of them twenty seven is a lunar number by the way uh twenty seven days on the sidereal orbit then it says uh, Sejemet, uh, uh, Sejemet Meduti. So this is basically hearing uh, the words. Uh, so he's once he has these vertebra, once he becomes the baboon, he becomes the judge, right? Um, and he is basically listen, governing and listening to their cases. And then the next thing is Ayn Unas, he has come, uh, Ayom. Uh, Ayamef, so he has uh, Ayamef, he has swallowed on, this is mirror, uh, the, the aromatic resin. So he has swallowed mirror, he has she, Shezep, he has received on mirror again, on. And on, by the way, is it could be a, a Heka invocation of, of Heliopolis. That is possible that on and on for Heliopolis, even though it's Ayunu, but on is another way that uh, it, you may have referred to it. It, it. They may have referred to it. So it may be a Hekar invocation of Heliopolis. I don't know in what way this makes sense here, but I just wanted to point it out. It's possible. So anyways, it says he has swallowed mirror. Uh, he has received mirror on, uh, and it says on, uh, on Eve, uh, M on, Onif, ah, he has, uh, Onif means he has, uh, I think it has something, to, he's basically enjoying the effect of the mirror, but I can't tell you the exact word. But as you can see, it sounds similar to the word itself. So there could be some kind of Heka uh, invocation again, because it's a wordplay, right? So yes, Onif, on Onif, and then it says on, uh, and then it says on, uh, on net, which is the fingernail, right? So he's getting the, the mirror under his fingernail. He's swallowing it, right? So there's different ways that he's being exposed to it. So um, then it says unas m on. There's more of this hemes, uh, uh, and uh, no, it says. I'm sorry. This means um, it says hem. Mes and unas us uh, certain your your powers. Uh, he ha he's controlling. I think that's what this means. He's controlling uh, your powers, uh, the gods. Pesher uh, and unas and nehebetev. He yeah. And so this what this means is that this is the ka assigner neheb. Uh, Neheb Kau is the Ka assigner, right? So Unas is basically saying is he's in charge. He has the power to assign Ka's. And so it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a, uh, um, how should I say, he's holding them hostage, right? So he's basically saying that uh, I control your Ka's. And so therefore you have to do what I say. Um, that's kind of the, the gist of, these, of this sentence, but I can't give you the exact um, a translation right now other than to say that, um, and the reason is because I can't really remember this particular verb here. This, uh, it normally this should be sitting, right? So, uh, Hemes and Zona sits, 
but that doesn't really make sense. So it, I think this is somehow, this has to do with controlling the, the powers of the gods. Um, and they should serve to Unas for he is the, yeah, he's your Ka assigner. That's, that's, that's kind of, you can translate it that way. Okay. Uh, words to be spoken. We have a new pyramid text here. Unas is the one. Uh, ka, uh, ka, I, I, uh, who, uh, so he's the bull uh, of the uh, the lights, the two lights. Harry, I, I read. So uh, uh, in the middle of his eye. Uh, so it's the bull, Ayahu, um, Ayahui, the bull of the of the two lights in the middle of his eye. So this could be the, the shine in the pupil, for example, or the iris or something like that. That's maybe what's refer what this means. Then it says jar, jar unas. Uh, uh, and I think this means to jar is usually crossing, transferring, faring, but jar has a different meaning, which also escapes me right now. So unas is some action. Let me see if I can figure it out. Mehe is a, some kind of uh, mehe is kind of, some kind of blast again. Uh, unas em upet that's the horns em upet nebu shemau. So he's the he is the um, he's the lord of the south. There's the southern horse. So this is the he's the lord of the southern horse, and the uh, seshemu he leads. Uh, by the way, the Shemsu are the followers and the Seshemu are the leaders, right? So Seshemu means uh, basically it translates it to causing to follow. Uh, and when you cause someone to follow, that means you're leading them. So Seshemu means lead. So Unas is leading. Unas leads uh, the, the god. Sechem means uh, he, he has the, Unas has the power and uh, he has the power uh, from the Aeneid, the nine, the nine god, the nine gods. Uh, Seret unas um, has, yeah. So this this Seret means cultivate or or mining potentially. Chesepet uh, means lapis lazuli. So this lapis lazuli is is this blue gemstone. Um, so this could be. So this seret is sort of refers to uh, mining, uh, lapis lazuli, lazuli. Then it says, um, uh, it says ag, that's cultivate unas. Um, and then it says tun, which is acacia of the south. Okay. Um, the, uh, this, yeah, so there's an interesting connection here. I'm going to just bring this up. So Seshem also means but is also uh, associated with the butcher house. Okay, there's a butcher house, for example, in the fourth dynasty, Hetaferis, Khufu's mother, was the Kherab of the butcher house. Kherab means the director of the butcher house of the Acacia. So there is a connection here between butchering and being in an acacia house. Here, it's used. So this is this is a heka connection, right? It's used. Sechem is used in as a, as the verb lead, and then here it mentions that Unas is cultivating acacia, right? He's saying ak Unas uh, tun of the south, right? But see how interestingly topographically these two connect, right? So it's an interesting. Thing about this acacia house potentially okay then it says are you um vazen so he's tying uh unas ties the aru which ropes he ties ropes uh shem shemet okay and that means shem shemet is yeah okay so this is now how um the sheptiu may come into play so remember the sheptiu are the two creator, they are the two facilities of Pata, the far and the, the far one and the great one. So the distant idea and the immediate thought in your in your uh, in your attention span. And they after initial titanic battle between land and sea, they make uh, they basically make peace 
once the land emerges and the water recline, uh, declines, uh, and um, and then they they tie together the reeds to make a perch for horse. Okay, and that is how now this comes into play. So you have basically uh, unas now tying. Okay, so uh, uh, thas and unas the ropes. Okay. For, so figuratively, it's the reeds, uh, and then she, uh, and then it says shem shemet. Okay, peppergrass is what that means. Um, so he's tying the peppergrass strings or ropes together. Okay, and that is a symbol for uniting the lands, and that comes up right now. Zema zema and so unas is is uh, is unifying uh, the skies, the pet uh, the petut or the the put. Sechem means he controls, Unas controls, and Taui, the lands as well, okay? Uh, the lands of the she Shemu and the Mehet Mehetiu. So it's the north and the south. So he's unifying them, he's controlling them. Then it says, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, u, I'm, u, I, uh, what, uh, I'm, I'm, it says, let's see, the moon and the south. Uh, uh, south and north. And the gods. Yeah, I forgot to say this. This this is the god sign. So he's he's unifying the lands and the north and the south. Uh, I can't really make sense of this right now, but let me just skip all forward. I'm just going to move on. It says then, I move. I moved, are you uh, at the building? Yeah, so I can't, this one also, I'm having trouble with this, but this one is building. So it says, red, reden. so Unas is, has um, built a town of the God. Okay, so he's built, he has built something. Um, and that, again, that goes back to the original Edwood Temple potentially. So this is a royal house, the original primordial uh, seat of the of the royal cult, the horse cult, right? That's one way you could see it. So he's unified the lands and he has built his capital. Okay, that's Nayut potentially, the godly the, the godly capital. Um, okay, then moving on, it says uh, this one, this symbol. I'm having a hard time seeing. That's an S. That's an R. Uh, something. Sida uh, unas pi. Yeah, can't help you with this one. Can't help myself with this one. Unas Pai, Unas is the one, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, this, oh, he's the third, yeah, Unas is the third, so this means, it means, Chemetnu, it's the third, okay, so he's the third, uh, and that's referring to him besides the, the sun and Ra and Taurus, okay? So, the, and of course that means because he's he's the baboon, he's the moon, that's what that, that's what that means. So he's not identical with Taurus, he's not identical with the sun, he is the moon, that's why he's the third. Um, and then it says Chaev, he has appeared, uh, um, yeah, or he has appeared as the third, that's what that means. Okay, next pyramid text. It says, uh, words to be spoken, uh, Chesaren, so that means to sweep the, um, yeah, so he has swept the night. Gere means the night. And now remember, we're talking about the moon again. So the moon, when the moon is up, the light is so bright that the stars fade away. You can't see the stars in the vicinity of the moon, especially if it's the full moon. And that's what this refers to. So he has swept away the night. And that means the, the darkness is gone because the moon shines bright when it's full. Zeben, he has basically sent away Unas. Unas has sent away the Unut. These are, remember, I've, if you remember, these are the hour stars that uh, the deacons, so to speak, that run on the ecliptic. And so that makes sense because the full moon is on the ecliptic. And so those stars fade away in the brightness of the full moon. Um, uh, so uh, the, the powers appear, uh, means appear, are the powers, so the powers appear, 
uh, saw who experienced uh, uh, the powers of experience of Unas appear. Or maybe it's uh, the experience of Unas. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. So the experience of Unas, Sahu and Unis, um, ba Bobby, there you go. So his experience uh, of Una, the experience of Unas is in his, in his role as the full moon, Bobby. So the, it's because it's because Thoth is the master of all Hekka masters. He is the most experienced one because he can come back to life within just a day, right? So he he passes he passes on as new moon when he's invisible, and then the next day he comes back as early crescent. And so so that's why Thoth is the ultimate master uh, of Hekka magic of creation uh, language. Unas Pai Za Pu. He's he's the he's the son. I chem I chem I chemet Yeah. So here's the confirmation that we're talking about Thoth. So it's Babi. He he uh, he's the son of uh, the one who does not know who bore him. Okay. In other words, he doesn't know his mother. It's just another way of saying that uh, he's Bobby, the, the full moon. Um, and now it says, Unas Nereni is yellow face. Okay, Reni is yellow face. So, he, so it's another description of the moon. Unas is of a yellow face. He's the Lord of uh, Shesem, the Shesemut and the Shesemut are the um, the night. I think they are the night, the eastern night skies, and that's because the 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 full moon rises brightly and majestically in the east, right? And so that's I think that's what this refers to. He's the basically the lord of the eastern night sky, and this means this is the symbol for night sky. And of course, when you see a full moon rise, it's a it's a majestic sight. So this makes perfect sense. It's very descriptive of the full moon. Certainly not a crescent moon or a new moon. We're talking about the full moon. So this confirms that Babi refers to the full moon. Uh, Khonzu refers to the new moon. Okay. And then we have the sickle, the, the ferryman, right? Which is the uh, which is the one that has his face in the back or his face in the front. Okay. And so we're going to get to that in a moment as well. Um, okay. So now it says, uh, Nebu. I men, uh, your great one, your you all, you all great ones, is the Lord Nebu, I men, the, the invisible Lord, Nathan, uh, Rechet, uh, so Rechet, Rechit means the people, um, Dep, oh, um, yeah, this is a little bit difficult to translate. So Uretten means your great one, Nebu means Lord, Aymen means invisible, Nai then do not uh rechit uh depi uh depi always. So these are the the arms. Yeah, I'm I'm having a hard time with this segment. Uh let me just go on so we don't uh, spent too much time trying to figure this. Maybe it'll come in a few minutes. So then it says, Unas is the one, uh, uh, there again, Babi, okay, Lord of the Shezemet. Uh, the Shezemet is, the again, the eastern sky. He's the Ka. Uh, he's the bull of, he is the Ka Ayon Nu, the bull of the, the baboons, okay? So he's the head baboon. Um, Remember the Jaisu, right, are basically the little baboons, the, the creation words, and then Thoth is the one who actually writes them down so that Shesat can archive them. Um, so that's, that's, that's what, that, this is not a bull, this is actually uh, the head baboon, that's what this is referring to. So he's the head, he's the, uh, he's the Ka of the Ayonu, Anch, uh, Anch, so he lives off the, uh, uh, 
who lives off the uh oh yeah so you uh they live in in his absence so so it, and that's what i was trying to say if the if the the full moon is so bright that you cannot see the stars only when the full moon is gone the stars can live because that's when they shine so that's what this means okay he's the he's the bull of the baboons and one lives only in his absence that's how you can translate this okay so now here we have now the ferryman mentioned so it says half m half so his behind his the back of his head is in the back so this is basically now a moon that's looking forward i i ein einen for unas bring for unas uh seferet these are offerings right seferet uh heret above uh Pesjut, okay. Um, Pesjut means bring offerings above the Pesjut. It's it looks like spines, yeah. It the backs or something like that of yeah of Osiris, right? So it's basically an offering to Osiris. So he's mentioned here for the last time in the pyramid text. So um, it's basically saying bring for Unas uh, a, an offering. Uh, above um above the spot so this means is the moon is now above orion in the sky so the moon is on the ecliptic so he has finally achieved his destiny which is in the sky so he has emerged from the achet he has risen he has uh, majestically overpowered all the other lights in the sky and now he's arising gradually on on the ecliptic and he's now eclipsing even uh, orion right so he's above orion and as a respectful gesture he's giving an offering and placing it on the back of orion it's beautifully done it's a very descriptive way to say that the moon is rising into the sky on the ecliptic and it's traversing it's passing above the head of osiris yeah beautifully done so it says uh, then uh, uh, um, Per means to come forth, Unas her, Heres. So above it, with with respect to the with respect to the sky, and then Unas and then it says Unas za, with respect to Ra and Pet. So he shall uh, be protected with respect to Ra in the sky. So here now at the very end, we all of a sudden we are talking about the sun again. After everything here was bit about the moon, basically, we got rid of the IR root here in the first column and uh, we turned into a baboon, which is this whole thing was basically about the moon. And we go all the way and then we, for diplomacy's sake, so to speak, we add a mention uh, of the sun at the very end. Um, it's <laughs> It's a it's an incredible piece of literature. I have to tell you, the pyramid texts uh, so far have just blown my mind, um, and the information that's hidden is so rich, as you can see. And uh, and I'm not picking up all of it. There's uh, you know I'm picking up a few things here and there, but there's still things hiding. And you you might be finding some things. Um, you know now you've been exposed to this, and maybe you feel inspired to learn some hieroglyphic. And, uh, and then you will find things that, uh, you know, I missed and then other people will find new things. So I, this is also one of my um, goals is to introduce this to a much wider audience because it's, it's a really, it's a difficult, obviously reading hieroglyphic is difficult and the pyramid texts are difficult to understand. They are, you know, people there, I think they're widely misunderstood, but when you read them in this way, I think things begin to make sense. I think What's been missing is really the astronomical depth to this, the resonance. And the other thing that's been missing is the Heka invocations that are hiding. And then the third aspect of this is that there is maybe a conspiracy going on here to subvert the what ostensibly looks like a solar cult. Um, but subversion is a strong word, but I, I should say that I think this may be an attempt to diplomatically keep the uh, a moon cult alive and uh, and also keep a memory of a lioness statue alive mahit that was converted into a sphinx and the moon cult was of course um, converted into a solar cult so i think 
maybe that's what's going on. That's why we have these underhanded uh, uh, gesture, that underhanded hints and clues that there's really something else brewing under the surface of, uh, of what looks like a simple resurrection story of the sun. So I think those are the, you know, the dimensions, how this text becomes deep. Anyways, uh, I think I've talked too much today. So I'm going to complete this video and I'm going to upload it. And, uh, and that's it for me for a few weeks. I'm going to Egypt and um, hopefully bring some new discoveries back and more films to come later. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.